welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. Springtime for Down Under Beekeepers. It's time to get another show on the airwaves, Gary. This is episode 127 of our beekeeping show. We are Gary and Margaret. We love honeybees and we are Kiwi Mana and we are beekeepers who live in the Watakri Ranges on the wild west coast of New Zealand. Kiwi Mana is a place where the beekeeping community can have a good chat about our favourite bee things and connect. And in this episode, we are talking about Coles Drops Imported Honey. What's invading the Norfolk summer? And what is the flight range of a honeybee? Okay, guys, well, we also, as if that wasn't enough, share all that stuff, is that we build and sell beekeeping supplies. We teach beginner beekeepers and provide beekeeper services and advice. We are the Bees Knees Club on the Facebooks. And great to have you joining us. We know life is busy for you, so we appreciate you've taken the time to join us today. Thanks for being part of the Kiwi Mana Buzz. Yeah, guys, that's fantastic. Oh, and by the way, we've also been known to go off on tangents about other issues. Well, it's officially spring in New Zealand, finally, with temperatures slowly rising. Last week during the day, we saw around... 9 to 13 degrees, so that would be about 49 Fahrenheit for our other folks over there. Then the last few days, 16 to 19 degrees Celsius, that's 60 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. So, but still some long periods of staying in, mainly due to the rain. So what does this mean, Gary? The bees are dealing with sporadic days who forage, and they are feeding heavily, as soon as the sun comes out, there are heaps of cleansing flights going round and around. No swarms reported in our neck of the woods yet. So what's been happening at Kiwi Mana for you, Gary? Well, I've been busy interviewing people. I interviewed Tracy and Paul from the Beehive Jive last week from South London. And we're hoping to interview the host of the Besotted podcast tomorrow. And also last weekend I went flying, so it was great fun. Thanks to Nick and Gary for all the encouragement and for people on the Bees Knees Club for uh, helping support that, eh? Yeah, that was your 50th, may I say, birthday present from, uh, yeah, all the, all the people that love you very much. Oh, that's awesome. And I've also been reading Noah R- Wilson's Rich's new book, The Bee, A Natural History. And he's agreed to come on the show, so I'd better hurry up and finish the book before I interview him. Yeah, get on with it, Gary. It's a great book. It's got lots of great photos. And what's been happening with you, Margaret? Well, everything's cool bananas at the moment, Gary. We did uh, talk about the American Fowl Brood uh, Levy, which was proposed as an increase, and unanimously everyone said no, and it hasn't been increased so we carry on as it is and we heard some interesting facts the other day that 15 percent of the AFB is caused by people with less than I think it's 10 hives and people with two and a half thousand hives or more are causing 50 percent of AFB issues so there's a lot of uh, telling in that those statistics so very interesting Yes, indeed. And we we did mention last week we tried to organise someone to come on the show to discuss the new levy, but they haven't got back to us yet. So Very disappointing because, I mean, these agencies need to connect with the the beekeepers on the ground and, yeah, they missed a really good opportunity to really put their case across, but never mind. Well, they are going to do some more discussions, so maybe we can uh, still get someone on here about that. Yeah, that would be awesome, and I know a lot of our hobbyists would be interested in that. Okay, moving on. Uh, well, as we start spring here in New Zealand, the colonies are busy whenever the sun shines. Temperatures colder now than they were in the middle of winter, actually, towards the end of winter. So very interesting. The girls have never stopped collecting pollen here, and all through winter they've had brood present. Um, right through, but smaller amounts of brood, more condensed. So in our smaller colonies, feeding has been necessary, with one getting a three frames of full-depth honey, 
and the other getting two frames of full depth honey. So, you know, that's pretty unusual for us to have to feed, but because these are two smaller colonies, they did need it. For all the other colonies, in terms of Varroa, they are looking really good. Bees are well formed. There doesn't appear to be any Varroa issues and no deformed wings at this point. And this means that we have had, and wait for it, 100% wintering over, Gary. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm very excited for this season. So we have worked hard this autumn and winter, keeping up with the um, oxalic acid vaporization treatments regularly, fortnightly, but one period where I saw some deformed wing, I was doing it once a week. Yeah, those cheeky varroa walking on the baseboard, I thought, yeah, I'm going to treat a little bit more, and that's been sorted out. So, yeah, now we're preparing for our preemptive splits, and what this means is that we split before we see queen cells present, and why? Well, we found that this helps in keeping our our surviving old queens and using their genetics for breeder hives. And this also gives us ongoing resources through the season if things go untoward, you know. What's the important keys to success with um, when you before you split a hive? Um, well, the method that we have on our website talks about having eight to nine frames of brood and also the drone side of things, making sure drones are around. There's no point starting to split colonies when you haven't got any drones around to help with the matings and from the preemptive splitting side of things we're working with our beginners and helping them split their colonies and deal with the issues of varroa and also we've added a service where you can have a look at bees for sale on our website if you want to get some colonies yeah we've got that listing service now so that's really awesome and that could be from anywhere in the world really eh yes and absolutely and speaking of anywhere in the world, Kiwi Mana, Global Roving Reporters. This week we've got reports from the USA, Canada, Switzerland and Iceland. Sounds and cold in Iceland, isn't it? It does. And we didn't hear from Joe in the UK? No, Joe's a no-show. So oh, no-show, Joe. That's okay. He's obviously busy bugs. Obviously busy bugs. Or oh, is it bizzle bugs? <laughs> bizzle bugs. <laughs> but we heard from Avery from Rascal's Apiary in North Carolina. Hello Kiwi Mana, Avery here reporting from Rascal's Apiary in North Carolina. Thank you both for the happy birthday last month. It made my day. I hope the weather over there is better than over here. It's been really rainy and it's getting cooler out, though the sun is still shining as bright as ever. Although, with summer comes pests. So we have two or more beetle blasters in each hive in order to prevent the rise in population of hive beetles and also start testing for varroa. Summer also means that wasps and hornets are out and about, so protecting hive entrances is highly recommended. Feeding should also be starting relatively soon, as I have already begun feeding my new nuke, which is also my first personal hive. Which reminds me, queen replacements should be done as well, seeing as if you miss your chance, the next one might not be until next spring, so start soon. Thank you for listening. Wow, can we say she's a rascal? Absolutely, we can. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, good yeah. luck with your new nuke. And yeah, um, we're so lucky in New Zealand we don't have to deal with hive beetles. I'm surprised that they're having summer advice because I thought they were going into um, the autumn. autumn. Now, eh? Yeah, coming into autumn. So that's uh, yeah, it's getting starting to wintering down over there, eh? Yeah, and it's interesting also that with what she's up to at the moment, she talks about the rain, but also about this whole thing about queens. You know, there's so many different methods in beekeeping, so it's not a practice that we do. We don't remove queens or add queens or anything like that. We try to use a colony to do that, so that's really fascinating, isn't it? Absolutely. Now we move over to Ron from Bad Beekeeping, the blog. And he's from Calgary in Canada. So let's have a listen to what's happening in uh, Alberta. Hello, Kiwi Maniacs. This is Ron Miksha reporting from Calgary, Alberta, Canada, where I'm going to bring you the current conditions for bees and honey production in Western Canada. Calgary is about a thousand meters, which is over 3000 feet above sea level and a long ways north. So we're high up in elevation, close to the Rocky Mountains. 
in an area that transitions from flat prairies into the mountains. In our foothills area, weather is highly changeable, and this year has been one for the record books. We had the hottest temperature ever recorded in Calgary. It was 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 37 Celsius and rather dry, although we've had the odd thunderstorms, a few hailstorms, and probably the right amount of moisture. In Western Canada, the main nectar flows are from alfalfa, sweet clover, alcyc and Dutch clover, and canola. Canola mostly being grown further to the east, out into the prairies, and not so close to Calgary, but it's probably the most important honey plant in the province because most of the bees are kept out in the prairie areas and not along the edge of the Rocky Mountains. The 20-year average for honey production in Alberta is 140 pounds per hive, and already virtually every beekeeper I've spoken with has passed that, even extracted more than 140 pounds from each of their hives. There are some beekeepers, particularly new ones, who are drawing a lot of foundation or don't have a lot of experience with bees who have had much smaller crops. But the majority of beekeepers with at least three or four years of experience or those commercial people whom I've spoken with have told me that it's been a very, very good year. They've produced a lot of honey. We've had the heat we needed. We've had lots of sunshine. We had just enough rain. And it's been a good crop. Most of the commercial beekeepers and better hobby beekeepers are going to end up with between 200 and 300 pounds of honey per hive in 2018. And that's pretty good, even for Alberta. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's excellent to hear about what's going on over in uh, Alberta and is it Calgary? Yep, Calgary and Alberta. Yeah, fantastic. So um, they've had a good honey production. I hope they keep some honey for their bees. Absolutely, and it sounds like it's pretty hot there, which is unusual because I know in winter it's like it, they get a lot of snow and it's really cold. Yeah, yeah. And it's great to hear that you guys have got a bumper crop. And now we're moving across across the Atlantic Ocean to Switzerland, where we hear from Niklas. He's a 16-year-old beekeeper from Switzerland who produces his own videos. He actually produces every video in German and English. Fantastic. So, so we uh, could all understand. Yes. So check out his YouTube channel. We'll have the link on the show notes. And the show notes will be kiwi.bz slash 127. So tell us what you're, what's happening in your area. Leave us a comment. And here's Nicholas. Yeah. So hey, Kiwimana. This is Nicholas from Central Switzerland. I'm 16 years old and I'm producing a video series about beekeeping on YouTube. So what currently is going on in Switzerland is very unusual. Due to the fact that Switzerland is on the Northern Hemisphere... It is very warm up here. We have had the whole summer extreme temperatures, what caused drought. In Switzerland we have no serious water problems because our glaciers are constantly supplying us with some fresh water. But glaciers are not limitless. Other countries in Europe got hit harder. For example, Germany has lost nearly 70% of their crops. Anyways, this is also bad for the bees here. I'm feeding my colonies since about one and a half months because otherwise they would starve. It's also dangerous to do now the varroa treatment because it's getting still nearly every day over 86 degrees Fahrenheit down here. In the Swiss Jura mountains, which are about 30 kilometers away from my apiary, the situation looks very different. They got nearly every night some rain from the clouds, which got caught up there between the peaks. These conditions are perfect to make leaf honey, so these guys up there don't even know anymore where to store all the buckets of honey. But that's enough for me. Let's go back to New Zealand, to Margaret and Gary. Yeah, thanks, Nick. cheers, yeah, Nicholas. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah, and he's saying that it's about 32 degrees. Wow, that's pretty blimmin' hot. It's pretty hot, but it sounds like a no, no good in Germany where it's got 70% crop loss. That's horrific. That isn't sounds it? terrible. But I think it brings us all to understand that food, which is plants and trees and all that for the bees, We need all that, and it's all connected, isn't it? And without those things, we're pretty screwed. So it's great to hear that there is honey production going on in areas, but also makes us aware that there's risks all over the place at the moment, isn't there? Yes, absolutely. And we will post a video on the show notes of from Nicholas, who's got some really amazing footage eh, of like the mountains and his bees and. Incredible video, eh? It It is, and it just shows you what he's been up to, and I think that, uh, yeah, it's very interesting, and uh, it's good to have this young energy here, eh? 
Yeah, and he's very talented, isn't he? And uh, we're actually going to be appearing in one of his videos, hopefully, so that'll be funny to watch, won't it? Oh, it'll be a real laugh. <laughs> see the old farts there. Yeah, we'll see what he, see what he can do with us. <laughs> anyway, now we've, got a, we've just got a late-minute caller here from Iceland. Let's play that. Wow, wow. I'm Ron Miksha. I keep bees in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. But I just returned from Iceland, so rather than talking about Calgary where our bees are doing fine and most beekeepers have just finished harvesting a pretty big crop. I thought instead what I'd do is uh, mention a few things to kind of show the differences between Iceland and Western Canada. Calgary was pretty good for bees this year, but it was a tough year in Iceland. Throughout June, July, and August, the temperature over there was pretty much around 11 or 12 Celsius for highs. That's in the low 50s in Fahrenheit and 7 or 8 degrees every night, which is mid-40s in Fahrenheit. Even worse, almost every single day brought rain. Officially, it was the coldest summer since 1914, making it the worst summer in a 100 years. The few Icelanders who keep bees made little or no honey this year. Because of the climate, Iceland is a challenging place to keep bees. I talked with one beekeeper who said she gave up beekeeping a couple of years ago. Others told me they will probably hang in there. Honeybees are not native to Iceland. Honeybees were brought to the island. Since honeybees are new there, I wondered what pollinated Iceland's flowers before honeybees arrived just a few decades ago. There were a lot of gorgeous blossoms everywhere I looked when I was exploring Iceland last week. It had been raining for months, but while I visited, the sun popped out and suddenly there were thousands of plump bumblebees on all sorts of flowers. It was really amazing. Iceland's handful of beekeepers need warmer weather so their bees can join the bumblebees in the meadows. I don't know how much competition exists between the species, honeybees and bumblebees, but honeybees in Iceland are mostly attracted to honeydew produced by aphids. Bumblebees are also known to collect some honeydew too, but I think it's rather infrequent that they get onto the honeydew. But honeydew is what bees gather most. Some told me it was around a half. The rest is largely from willow, arctic thyme, dandelion, and arctic flowers of different types. When a good crop comes in, Icelandic beekeepers can make 40 or 50 pounds per hive. Looking at beekeeping in Iceland helps put our own Canadian good fortune in perspective. Here we had nice weather, but it was cold and wet all summer over there. No amount of good beekeeping management can fix that. No. Wow, double billing from Ron. So that's awesome and interesting to hear about the fact that the bees are still alive. Yeah, you know? sad, eh? In Iceland, 11 degrees in, in summer, that's terrible. Yeah, but it, it goes with the territory, I guess. And, and it's so awesome to hear from Nicholas and hear the bees and everything in the background, eh? That yeah, was awesome. It was awesome. So um, thanks, guys. Thanks to Nicholas, Ron. Avery, and it's great to have these roving reporters. It just makes it so much information. Yeah, thanks for sharing, guys. And, you know, anyone can be a roving reporter. So. Yes, anybody can be a roving reporter. It'd be awesome if you could help keep be part of the show. All you need to do is record a one or two minute thing with your local weather and how the bees are doing in your area. So send a file to me at gary at kiwimana.co.nz. You can join the mailing list and we'll drop you an email to remind you when we're recording the show. Yeah, and it would be awesome if you could help create the buzz and be part of the show and report from your location whilst you're in the field, guys. Absolutely. And what's happening in New Zealand? In New Zealand, August happenings from emails that we've been getting through are that we're droning on. What do you mean you're droning on? (laughs) Well, Andrew Crossan says Kaikoura Coast booming with bees and hundreds of drone. Also shares a bit of advice for dampness in the hives. If you use a propolis mat, put them on before winter with a division mate with entrance facing down, which allows the dampness to escape. Does he mean a division mat or mate? Mm, I don't know. (laughs) I think it's a division mat. I think it's a mat. Yeah. Anyway, at present, putting strips in plus pollen substitute and scraping wax from top and bottom bars. And he's from Mill Creek Apiaries. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. That's awesome. And what does Chris Mitchell say? Chris says mature drones in coastal areas around Tauranga. 
and that's in the Bay of Plenty, and no drones up in the hills yet, and he's from Seaside Bees. Yes, thanks Chris for the input, and what does Trish have to say? Well, Trish is not only a patron, but she shares that, no drones here in South Waikato yet, left heaps of frames of honey which have not been used yet, and she says spring can be changeable, so thanks Trish, Chris and Andrew for sharing. What's going on in August in New Zealand? And she raises a good point there. This is the time of year when when you've got to have honey on there because some sometimes hives starve out this time, eh? Yeah, very true. Which which has happened in a few areas around Auckland. So people, you've got to leave enough honey on for the girls. And check your bees at the moment for if they've got enough resources for the next month or so. Yes, and we've had some other emails with problems in the beehive as we are going into spring. And there was a mention via email that some folks are seeing some deformed wing bees out the front of their hives. Another beekeeper says that his hive has failed. And he mentioned that about three or four weeks ago it was doing really well and really um, pumping. But then within that three weeks, um, it's failed. And so I've put a blog together and it gives a action plan ideas and just some context to the timing of doing some treatments, uh, recommended uh, oxalic acid vaporization in this situation, mainly because it's going to be the less harmful to the bees and most beneficial to helping them survive. Awesome. So I'll put a link to that new blog post coming soon. It's ready now. Okay, so what should you be doing with your bees in New Zealand? Best advice is to understand what is going on in your hose as we hit spring. Assessment inspections are essential. Ensure the varroa are not causing problems and and or ill health. Don't let your bees starve, as we said before. Sadly, this is a delicate time for our colonies. Make sure they have food. Yeah, guys, feed them. Make sure they've got honey, which is the best nutrition for them. And sugar syrups, if you haven't been good enough to leave them the honey, and if the demand is there, you need to feed, eh, Gary? Absolutely. And what kind of ratio would you be doing now? I'd say one to one, eh? One to one, so there's not too much water in there, eh? No. And in the UK, as I said last week, I spoke to Tracy and Paul in South London, and they say the bees are suffering from the lack of nectar due to the massive heat wave they've had over there. And that's also called a a dearth in nectar, so no honey production. So many folks are needing to feed there. Yeah, so that's 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 also, um, you'd have to have water around too, wouldn't you, in those kind of situations? If you go out to the bees and you see that they're grumpy or anything, you could do a light spray mist uh, with water and a fine mist sprayer. And if you are inspecting, you could use a wet towel just to cover the hives while you're working, and that just keeps the bees a bit calm. And what's happening in the USA? Well, Avery talks about um, what's going on there and now um, the little rascal roving reporter. Blog recap. Top content. Buy your vote from last month. Well, last month. We're still getting into the swing of things. So we only released two, sh- two shows. We released one, two, six. Lots to be getting on with. And question time bonus, which was uh, the bonus show for the patrons. And so the most popular one was the uh, lots to be getting on with. And we've got lots to be getting on with too, haven't we? What products have been used in our work, Gary? Well, nothing beer related. I'm just working on the back end of the website. And I'm looking at ways we can reduce costs at the moment. And we've had to do this, guys, because we need more support from you. If you found anything of value in this uh, podcast and you think it was worth maybe a dollar a month, then please become a patron. Yes, and what have you been using, Margaret? Well, we've we've been running a class, and we're hoping to arrange the April visit now that the temperatures are starting to warm up a bit, because it, we need a bit of time so that the, the students can have a good look in the hive. So um, we're going to um, set that up so that the students can meet the bees. And basically the same as in the last podcast, ongoing use of my oxalic acid vaporization gear and my frame holder's been fantastic. 
this is a time of the year in New Zealand where we have to do our disease elimination conformity agreement and check out for AFB, uh, American Fowl Brood. And it's great also because if I have my frame holder there, I don't have to worry about holding it. And then I can just take photos on what's um, showing on the frames. And yeah, it's awesome. So that's been my go-to at the moment while we're preparing for our spring swarming, growing, breeding awesomeness. Banana! Beekeeping news. News you can reuse. Anyway, beekeeping news. This month. <laughs> Oh, you're crazy. This, crazy like a fox. This podcast was made possible thanks to our patrons, especially this month. We would like to thank Justin Bumstead. Justin has been supporting the Kiwimata bus since April 2017. Oh, awesome. So if you need any uh, honey or honey-based products, check out localhoney.melbourne. And he's in Melbourne, obviously. And there's Bumstead Family Apries. Thanks for your support, Justin. Yeah, awesome, Justin. And it's people like yourself that are helping us do the work that we do. So become a patron, guys, through our Patreon application on our website. If you think we're worthwhile, please sponsor us on kiwi.bz slash banana. Okay, first story from Norfolk Wasp Invasion. Heatwave sees numbers of wasps soar. What's going on here, Margaret? Well, hot stuff going on in Norfolk, UK. Here's the block quote from this article. Richard Pummel of Norwich and Norfolk Pest Control called the prevalence of wasps the worst in his 26-year history of doing the job. Well, it's definitely causing folks to feel hot under the collar. And what's the next part of this quote, Dale? Andrew Dalbridge of Ace Pest Control said the amount of wasps this year had been unseasonal adding that the number of nests he has cleared has increased from four or five every one or two months to dozens upon dozens a week. He said, I had to clear them out of the pub gardens from barbecues and even from a local school. That's how they speak in Norwich. Is it? Is it? Oh, interesting. Visitors to Raw Dinosaur Adventure Park in Linwood have found themselves stung by more than long queues in the heat. Rachel Holman, a season ticket holder at the attraction, said the number of wasp pestering guests was worse than I've ever seen before. The article goes on to say the park owners attributed the wasp, the current wasp frenzy, to a seasonal insect phenomenon called hyperphagia, where the queen wasp evicts workers from nests by refusing to feed them. This leads the desperate and irritable wasp searching for nutrition elsewhere making them more prominent in areas where there is water and food. The article also goes on to mention about taking care when you try and get rid of wasps. Oh, and you won't believe this. What? He also spoke up for the unpopular insects. He said, the nests I have found near my house I refuse to touch. It sounds silly to say as I work in pest control, but I don't like harming them unnecessarily. They have such a vital role in the regulation of the local ecosystem and in pollination. Live and let live, I say. Well, uh, me, not so much. Well, the thing is, that in, in England, they have natural enemies, whereas in New Zealand, they don't. So it's a bit different. It's a different situation here than it is in, in England. But they're not actually from England, are they? They're not native to England, are they? I think they, they are native to England. Oh, yep. that's very I'm interesting. Pretty sure they're original to England. As I spoke to Tracy and Paul in the weekend, they said they were native to England. So. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, we got no feedback on this one. Everyone's probably just saying what what a bunch of <laughs> they are. Anyway, Gary, moving on. What's this? Coles drops imported honey brand, a Lowry, from their shelves. Yes, this is good news from across the Tasman for bee keepers and our Australian bee mates. Coles, a supermarket chain, has dropped the imported honey brand, a Lowry, which is made from imported honey. Let's hope this translates to more honey sales of local Australian honey. Yay! And quoting from the article, shoppers and Coles have one less choice to make when shopping for honey 
as the supermarket giant has dropped a Lowry brand of honey, which is produced from mostly imported products by the Australasian company Capilano Honey. Well, this is good news, eh? Yeah, it's fantastic and great for Aussie beekeepers, and that's the way it should be. They should be able to, you know, sell their own brands and not have to compete with other honeys. I think honey should be sold to local folk in their local supermarkets and it helps their local health and well-being as well, in my view. Absolutely. We had some feedback from Simon Mulvaney. He's from Save the Bees Australia, and he says media are scared to mention Save the Bees Australia. Well, Simon, I've just mentioned you. so There you go, Simon. And thanks. <laughs> he says thanks for doing a podcast on the campaign. And the brand is the subject of a court case after social media campaign raised questions about the origin and quality of the Lowry brand. And I think it's good to see we should all support our local food producers. Local food for local folk makes all of us healthy. And if you're in Australia, Simon runs a, a honey map on his bethecure.com.au and you click on honey map. And it shows you a map of Australia and you can actually find your local beekeepers. Rather than supporting huge, you know, supermarkets, you can support a local beekeeper and you're guaranteed to get non-imported honey. Yeah, and corporates are just not connected enough with their locals and, yeah, support this Save the Bees Australia. And support this honey map. So, yeah, that's a great idea, eh? We should get something like that for New Zealand, shouldn't we? Oh, stop press. Stop press, stop press. Australia's biggest honey producer, Capilano Honey, is set to be taken over by a private equity group specialising in China-focused agricultural experts. So they actually looks like they're going to be bought out. I thought they had already gone and had gone it's, ahead. It's in proposal at the moment. And oh, you can okay. read more. We'll have a link in the show notes to the full article about this proposed takeover. And Margaret, anything but the nine to five. A beekeeper with an allergy to bees? Yes, this shows atypical behaviour by a beekeeper. Despite the challenge of being allergic, this couple admit to being avid, bee-loving hippies 24-7. We've got a sound clip from this too. Shall I play the sound clip? Yeah, go for it. So we're trying to do an urban hive business. So just urban pollinators and people who love honey. And they rent a hive and they get to keep a percentage of the honey and they get all their garden pollinated. You just rent it out for a yearly fee. And we'll do, well, Cole, Cole will do all the servicing for you. <laughs> yeah, and everyone seems to, to really enjoy the process there as well. So I'll show them what we're doing at different times of the year and try and explain a little bit as we go. Okay, so it looks like Sarah and Cole are setting a high rental business. And what area is this? It's down in New Plymouth. The article talks about. From the front, it looks like any other suburban house, but venture in a little further and you'll find a nature lover's paradise. It goes on to say Sarah already knew what it was like to be allergic to bees. She found out when she was a child, but that didn't stop her setting up the urban beekeepers with coal at their New Plymouth home. Yeah, and the couple aren't scared of getting stung. In fact, they don't even wear protective gear when dealing with their buzzy little buzzy buddies. Yeah, everything in nature is precious, it says. Bees pollinate 98% of all plant species, Cole said. I heard a stat that says if the bees die, within three years we'd starve to death. They are, meaning the bees, are really struggling at the moment, but they seem to be doing really well in town in the urban area. Four of the hives line the fence backing onto their neighbour's property and on a sunny day, busy bees travel and fill the skies. So let's leave it there. Well, no, let's not leave it there. What's your feedback, Gary? Well, I mean, this thing about if they're allergic, they shouldn't be keeping bees. But I think their definition of allergic is they swell up, which is normal, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the reality is the human body will always react to venom and the normal reaction is a bit of swelling, then itchiness, and that is a normal reaction for your body, which is doing the right thing to protect you from that venom. It isolates the area and you swell up and then it starts to settle down as the body deals with the venom and then it becomes itchy as it starts to heal. So that's a normal allergic 
reaction in terms of survival mode. But anaphylaxis is something totally different, isn't it? Yeah, and if, and if I was anaphylactic shock, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't work bees without a suit. So you guys yeah. be careful if that's the case. And yeah. good luck with your new business, guys. Yeah, um, we did get some feedback on with some very valid points about this article. And Terry Cornbury says, It's really nothing about allergy and all about their hive hire business. Says nothing useful about allergy. And if their allergies are real, using no gear is dangerous. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, if you could die from a single bee sting, then keep away or at least wear a full suit, guys. And gloves. Yes, exactly. So Kai Ho I O Kai He Weber says, sounds like they get a reaction to a bee sting like most. If truly allergic, they would end up in hospital on a drip, sometimes on life support after a sting. No allergic to bee stings person would work without suit ever and would be wiser not to keep bees. That article is BS. <laughs> yep. I, I think, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes the reporters misquote things and uh, they kind of spend a lot of time talking about the allergies and I don't think they're allergic to the bees. I think it's just a normal reaction. Anyway, yeah. let's leave it here. Okay, Gary, sphere of influence, the flight range of the honeybee. Yes, this is a great article from a Scottish beekeeping blog and about the different the distances, different cast of honeybee travel, which surprised me. Sorry, but can you tell me what, Casts mean? The casts are like the different types of bees in the hive, like the drones, the workers, the queens. Oh, okay. Thank you. And quoting from the article, how far do honeybees fly? An easy enough question, but one that is not straightforward to answer. And a lot of this research came from a, an experiment which was done by John Eckhead in the 1930s, and you can actually download that from this article. Yeah, he actually did some studies in the Badlands in America, which has got no flowers or anything, so he could do some definitive studies. And he determined that worker bees can fly up to 8.5 miles or 13 kilometres. Drones, 90% of the matings happen within 4.6 miles or 7.4 kilometres. And queens can go up to 6.4 miles to mate or 10.3. Amazing, isn't it? 13 kilometres is a yeah. long way. And uh, because if there's not a lot of food, they may have adapted to that situation and um, flow in further to achieve what they need to collect. So John Eckert has really established something really amazing in this study. Yeah, and he he did determine that when they're doing those kind of mileage, the hives do suffer and they do eventually run out of food. The energy they're, they're using to get to the food is not enough to keep it going, so it's not self-sufficient. Oh, that's very sad. It's the demise of the honey bee in the in that area, I guess. Well, that was done in the 1930s, so all those bees are probably dead now anyway. Yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> <laughs> if they're not, they're pretty amazing. You know, that's a good article to read, and you can actually look at the the, proper, the full study. It's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's great. And having this kind of learning going on does show you how awesome bees are and how they will adapt. But whether they adapt and survive, that's the whole question this is presented, hasn't it? Absolutely. Speaking of adapting. If the problem continued for the bees, I don't know if they would have made it. That's right. And what's your number one beekeeping problem? Yeah, when people join our newsletter, which you can join at kiwi.bz slash sign up, you get asked a question, what's your number one problem? And we try and answer those on the podcast. And here is this month's one. We've got two. They're very, very similar, eh? Yeah. So AFB, we have had to destroy two hives in the past 18 months. As we only have one or two hives, this is becoming a very expensive and depressing exercise. Sadly, in our area, there are either infected wild nests or other beekeepers keeping quiet about their infected hives. This problem has been around for decades nationwide and will be impossible to eradicate. Isn't it time we started learning how to manage rather than eradicate as they do in other countries? And that was from Name Redacted. And the next one, similar. I'm just about to set up my new, my first new beehive, but they are some old wooden and plastic beehive frames where I live. I don't know what the origin is. Should I burn them? 
Or is there some other way to get rid of the plastic part of the frame? This is from Kate. So she's obviously concerned about the infection of AFB. Um, well, addressing that one first, I would say don't use them. I wouldn't burn the plastic ones, but what do you do with if, if plastic frames have got AFB? I don't know. I mean, if you don't know the origin of secondhand gear, I, would, I wouldn't trust it because yeah. AFB not... spores can last for 40, 50 years. Yeah, I mean, the reality is is that if you're setting up a hive uh, and you buy secondhand gear, and then you put a hive in there, and then they start to get sick, and the brood is all sick. Then, what's the point? So, our advice is always to get fresh, new gear for the person that has the AFB in the area. Then, it's very hard to actually think about getting that sorted out. But my advice would be to contact uh, Assure Quality, notify them about the issue you're facing. And they will get some guys to come and check the area for what may be the problem. Why don't they contact the AFB agency first? Because the Assure Quality are contracted to the AFB agency, aren't they? I guess my point is is that the Assure Quality being the contractors, they will probably have some local guys that will come. Yeah, true. And then they, they would be required to report to the agency about that and you can do it directly to the AFB agency. Two options there. Yeah, I mean the good thing about the wild hives is they will well that when they die they will be eaten out by wax moths and they will be destroyed, so that's good. But local beekeepers that's it, it's it's very difficult and a lot of people don't register their hives unfortunately in New Zealand. As Margaret said, the best thing to do would be contact the agency and also if you can get together with other beekeepers in the area Maybe even like do some bee lining and try and find out where all the hives are. At least try and educate them. But you know you've got to be very careful of walking on people's property and telling them about bees and stuff. I guess. But I know it's difficult, eh, when you've got people that don't want to play the game. Well, we do know of people who have had uh, AFB issues in the area, and they are carrying on. They they have robbing screens on their hives. They've got the hives lifted up higher, so they don't get damp and sick. They keep honey for the bees, their own honey. So you're you're contributing to a very healthy colony, which can withstand some of the issues that are faced, you know, in terms of disease. So that's not the cure for AFB, but a strong hive can respond better than a weak hive. And the other thing is, is just want to say that wax moth won't eat brood. No, but it'll... They basically clean the hive out and all the dead brood will be rotted away anyway. Yeah, but then there's still a risk, isn't there, if there's any honey there, which is usually on separate frames. But I think the reality is is that if you get AFB, you have to destroy your hives in New Zealand. That is the law. And trying other methods because you, you think that that's the way to go is not the way to do it because when you burn a hive, you are eradicating the spread or transference. Yeah, I mean, I, in the past I've advised people that have had issues like this because they, they, some people have had AFB every single year. From So obviously there's some, someone in the area that's not a very good beekeeper and there's, they've got AFB in their hives and not, they don't realise they've got it. The best advice to me is move your bees somewhere else, at least 5Ks away, and then hope that they, they do better, eh? And just don't have them at that location for a couple of years. I mean, the other thing is gloves, tools, footwear, your vehicle that you've gone in and out of, perhaps with your beekeeping boots, you know, spray the area around the hive where the AFB has been um, with a bit of bleach and water, and yeah, it might kill a bit of grass, but basically it will, it may affect the spores, so just Complete beekeeper hygiene when you're in this point, and I think the best thing to do is follow the rules, report it, get someone out there to find out what's going on, and work with those authorities to try and identify who's causing this issue, and start afresh, and get your bees from another area, and like yeah. you said, Gary, move move them away for ha- perhaps while the season goes through, and then go from there. Yeah, but I can understand their frustration that you know they're doing everything right and someone else isn't, which is really one of the most frustrating things in beekeeping. 
Well, it's one of those areas that you don't have control over. We do everything that we can in our own apiary, but what goes on outside our apiary is totally beyond our control, guys. So start a conversation with local beekeepers. Absolutely. And what, what's your big, biggest beekeeping problem? You can tell us on kiwi.bz slash problem, or you can leave a message on our speak pipe. Or if you have an urgent issue, check out the Bees Knees Facebook group, which is beesknees.club, and you can leave a message there. Yeah, thanks, guys. Well, that's been awesome. We've had so much to share this week and chat about. It's been fantastic. Feedback from you guys. We got a new patron this month, so fantastically new supporter, Rebecca Wade from Kentucky. Thanks, Rebecca, for supporting what we do, and we appreciate your contribution. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, we really say if you get anything of value from this conversation, please consider supporting us. We would greatly appreciate your support and help. Kiwi.bz slash banana. So when you become a patron, there's always a little bit extra for you. Yes, and that's called the bonus show. This month we're talking about planting for honeybees and why bee removers shouldn't use fire. (laughs) It's a good one. It's a good one. And the bonus show is for our supporters. So thanks, guys, for all your support. You are amazing. Thank you. Support, support, support. We need it all. Absolutely. And the next show we're talking to Paul and Tracy from South London and they do a podcast called The Beehive Jive. Woohoo! We'll be rocking. We'll be rolling. Yeah, you know they they're uh that's that's a good talk. And if you want that show to automatically appear on your podcast device or phone, please subscribe in your podcast device or download our free application from the App Store. The show notes for this podcast are kiwi.bz slash one two seven. So please leave us a comment on what you thought about the show. We didn't hear anything last month, did we? No, but if you want to be a roving reporter, easy to do, eh, darling? Yeah, well, you want to leave a comment, do that on the page. Or email us. Many ways to get in touch with the Kiwi Mana buzz. Okay, thanks, guys, for listening, and we will talk to you in a couple of weeks. Woohoo! See ya! do 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 Yep, let's go, Snow. We're going to have a cup of tea. Come on. Come on, come on.